Well, I'll start just with a little brief introduction to my company. As Jeff said, I, um, I work for Direct Energy. Direct Energy is part of Centrica PLC, which is a very large and well-established, and by well-established, I mean incorporated over 200 years ago. So we talked about this morning about trying to innovate inside of established companies. I think you know I'm getting to experience that firsthand. Uh, and Centrica is a British company. So for those of you old enough to remember, Britain used to be an important country, part of Europe, <laughs> right? Now it's relegated to a large rock in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, so Centrica does all the traditional things you would think that an energy company does. We produce energy, both oil, gas, store energy. We, we own and operate power plants primarily in the UK. But the perspective that I bring today is we're also one of the largest consumer-facing energy companies in the world. And what I mean by that is we have 18 million homeowners and over a million and a half businesses in the UK, Ireland, Canada, and the United States that get their energy from my company. So that is the perspective that I will offer my comments. So I'm big on solving problems, and this is the real simple math, right? When we talk to businesses today, they're fundamentally trying to talk to us about this equation, which is how much money are they going to spend on energy? And this is a conference about portals and platforms, and I personally believe that portals and platforms have a big role to play in helping us solve this basic energy equation, price times quantity equals spend. On the price side, we certainly can help customers manage energy volatility and maybe procure energy differently and better and more cost effectively. On the consumption side, I know that we can help customers better think about the way that they're using energy and maybe even producing energy themselves. And so really, that's what we'll kind of, I will come back to this equation, right? The other thing I wanted to do up front is just because I realize this isn't an energy conference is just sort of do a little table setting. So here it is, the market, what do we know? In 14 states in the US, the electricity market is deregulated. What that means is homes and businesses can buy their energy from somebody other than the incumbent utility. When given that choice, 70% of businesses actually buy their energy from somebody who is not their incumbent utility under the utility rate structure. And that represents about 15% of all the business consumption in the United States, okay? So it's a fairly big opportunity, but yet it is not the entire energy market. The other thing we know is energy is becoming much more decentralized. So the old model of building a centralized power plant and pushing electrons many miles through transmission and distribution is fundamentally still the way we get energy today, but that is increasingly changing. We just hit the point where we have a million homeowners with solar photovoltaic on their roof in the United States. So we sort of are getting to a tipping point where energy production in and of itself will become increasingly more distributed. The other thing I can tell you from having dealt with, you know, we have half a million business customers in the United States, um, and I've been doing this for 20 years, is that engagement around energy is really, really low, meaning people don't really think about it. I guarantee nobody came into this room this morning thinking about how, what source was powering the lights in here or what energy source was making the room the appropriate temperature. There's very little engagement around it. And I would hypothesize that the number one reason why that's true is people just feel like it's out of their control, that they simply don't understand what is driving their energy consumption or what they can do about it. And the experience is, think about your own home, you get a bill, right, about 10 days after your meter is read, and it's generally in terms you don't understand anyway, kilowatt hours and kilowatts and demand and usage and but you just look at it. So what you know is you're getting billed for something that you need, but you don't really understand what's driving it either on the cost or the use side, right? So that is where we are. And so because of that, a lot of businesses, larger consumers of energy, go out and they hire consultants to help them figure that out. So this is just kind of 
This is the way the, the industry works today. But there's a huge opportunity, right? And I'll just share that if we think about the commercial building stock in the United States, five and a half million buildings, and they're using over $140 billion of energy consumption in there. But the government data will tell us that about 3% of those facilities are Energy Star certified, which think about it as sort of the good housekeeping seal of approval for energy efficient. And even more, you know, sort of starkly putting it, the estimates are that up to 30% of all the energy consumed in these facilities is wasted, right? That's a huge waste, big opportunity, right? And about half of that, 10%, let's call it 10%, could actually be accessed through, through no investment whatsoever, but just simply changing behavior, right? So that's kind of the landscape. Many buildings will have, a typical large building will have what's called a building management system. So if you have a large facility, you may have invested hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe even a million dollars or more in a building management system, very sophisticated, right? But that's only in about 5% of the buildings. So the landscape that, that my company approaches this from is we know that there's a huge opportunity. You can largely impact things through behavioral change and only about 5% of buildings due to cost actually have proper controls. So we went out and invested and continue to invest in what is called our panoramic platform. And the panoramic platform, very simply, uses distributed sensors. They're little orange clips like you see here on the screen. They're about half the size of the remote in my hand. They, you could think about a circuit panel that you might have in your home or business. You open it up, you clip them on the wires. The electromagnetic field self-powers those devices, which sends information to a bridge, which has a SIM card, which sends that information to the cloud, where it is we crunch it through data science and analytics, and we deliver it back to consumers in real time on mobile applications. Right? So from an experience before where you had one data point, 10 days after your meter was read, we're now collecting 10 second pulses at a circuit level, right? So a dramatically different experience. What does that enable? Well, as you would expect, energy data offers energy insights. And from those energy insights, a, a business owner could really get granular into what is driving their energy consumption. Which devices are consuming how much energy at what times of day? They could also look and justify investments that they might want to make in their facilities. So if you're going to make an invest in something, you want to know what the baseline is and how it changes to justify your capital expenditure. You might want to compare across various sites and say, which of my sites is a high performing site or a low performing site? So there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of use for energy data in and of itself to create opportunities to be more efficient. And that's, that's sort of the obvious thing. Let's use energy data to be more energy efficient. However, what we're seeing is that you can also use that energy information to do some different things. And one of them is to be better at predicting maintenance in your facility. So the devices and through machine learning algorithms, iterative algorithms that we've built in, uh, against this, it recognizes what the electrical signature of the device is and it can tell is this an air compressor, is it lighting, is it a motor, is it a refrigeration unit. So the, the, the machine learning recognizes the device and then also recognizes what state the device is in. Is it on, off, idle, or cycling? Why is that important? So if you think about if you were a facility manager, you want to do preventative maintenance. You want to do maintenance on equipment before it breaks. Because when stuff breaks, it's a, it's a lot more expensive and it's a lot more problematic, right? Downtime, discomfort, uh, productivity loss. But the trick is, preventative maintenance, you don't know which devices to do the preventative maintenance on. Through this, 
we are seeing that customers are recognizing when they should be doing maintenance on particular devices. If you have a refrigeration unit and your refrigeration unit is not cycling, it will break. So the food in your grocer's case will spoil, right? So this, there, here we're using machine learning and very granular circuit level data pushed up into the cloud to deliver to people via a mobile experience on how they can do better maintenance uh, within their facilities. <clears throat> the third piece, which wasn't necessarily intuitive to us when we first got into this, is that people are using that same energy data to actually make business decisions. So they're starting to look at the data itself, and this is a heat map, you know, you could see of the, the total energy consumption, but you could see that one of the facilities here is leaving equipment on or lighting on all night long, even when the facility's closed. So we're working with a, you know, a fairly well-known fashion retailer that has 150 stores in 15 different countries that has this sort of system deployed. And what they're learning is, are the stores opening on time? Are they closing on time? Are they, are they following protocols? All of this is coming through energy data. The other thing is, uh, we had another customer that actually you have protocols in any facility. Their protocol was, we will charge our forklifts. So forklifts are generally battery charged, and they take a long time to charge those batteries, probably eight to 10 hours. And their protocol was, we're going to charge them overnight. Not just because electricity is cheaper overnight, because if you're charging them during the day, it is a massive loss of productivity, right? It doesn't pay to have you know, some pieces of critical equipment charging during the middle of the day because they're not being productive. And they actually use this energy data to learn that that is in fact what was happening at their facilities. So you can use energy data to make better decisions and triage things to improve your operations. And the final piece on this is, of course, you could always plot your energy consumption against your own sort of production and intensity, right? And, and then you know, see what is really driving consumption and does it make sense? The final story on, on this is we had a plastics uh, or a, a metal alloy manufacturer and they have a bunch of bag houses. You can get these big motors, bag houses to sort of collect the dust and debris. And they had three of them. And we use this data to say, well, it seems like you're overusing bag house number two. It's using all of this energy. You should more evenly distribute your production. And they said, what are you talking about? We, we do evenly distribute our production, right? So from this, they determined that one of their bag house motors was using twice as much electricity to use the same amount of work. They saved $118,000 in the first year by changing out that motor, right? Good operational decisions they're making. So clearly you can see that from energy data, you can create platforms and ecosystems that can change the way people engage and think about energy in a way that we have not done as an industry to date. <clears throat> so now I'll flip and talk about the P side of the equation, price. How do people procure energy? So again, the experience today, and I, you know, we know this from dealing with many, many businesses, is about two thirds of businesses go out, they hire a consultant, the consultant solicits a bunch of suppliers, they buy a fixed price offer, which means they accept a fixed price rate plan from a supplier for about 18 months in length. And that's what they do. The, there is very, very little online e-commerce going on in the energy space. Less than 5% of transactions. I contrast that with the research from Forrester that says the B2B market is over a trillion dollar market. The majority of buyers would actually prefer to go online and not deal with a sales rep, in fact, if they knew what they wanted to buy. And we add into that the, the concept of millennials. The oldest of the millennials is in their early 30s now. And they are going to be the people, they are the people running small businesses, and they're going to be the people making all these purchasing decisions. So if, if the, the usage of the internet or a portal to procure energy, sort of you would say the proclivity is there, but the reality is we're not doing it. <clears throat> but I do believe it's coming. 
I think that we will solve as an industry some very basic roadblocks to why people are not doing it today. One is every supplier has a different contract with general terms and conditions. The other one is you have to do credit. So credit is sort of very, uh, the bilateral nature of these transactions is there's a credit component to it. Um, and everybody's energy consumption profile is different. So the price that you would give them to take on that risk and insulate them from that volatility is different by the individuals. So we have to solve all of those. I believe that the suppliers, including my company, will be the ones that will sort of lead that. It's not that there are no portals today or e-commerce today, there are. It's just it's not being used in, uh, to the degree that it could be. But that's all sort of, you guys are probably sitting there and saying, yeah, John, that's pretty basic stuff, right? Like that's just e-commerce on the internet should happen, I get it. But more interestingly, <clears throat> I really think the future of energy is going to be about peer-to-peer -peer transactions. So if you take where we started, where energy is becoming more distributed and decentralized, that means that people are not only consumers of energy, but they are producers of energy. <clears throat> and at certain times, they will have excess production of energy. And I do believe that we're going to get to a place where we'll have a platform or a portal or an ecosystem where you will be able to match you know, thousands and who knows, someday maybe millions of consumers and producers of energy with each other. So if you are part of a neighborhood and you have uh, solar on your home and you're not home during the day, instead of pushing that back into the grid and selling it to the utility at you know, the utility tariff rate, because there's only one option now, that's who it is, it's the utility, you will be able to sell to you know, your baker down the street who wants to buy that energy, uh, wants to support renewable energy, and they want to transact to you, that will happen. So that truly will be a many-to-many. -many. The other thing is, I think that, because it reduces the friction costs of, of transactions, will lead to what I call microtransactions. Instead of people buying 18 months of energy for a fixed price, you'll buy 18 hours of energy. You know, you'll be thinking about, well, what should I do for tomorrow? Or maybe you will have a machine or some sort of algorithm thinking about that for you. And that kind of drives to my last point, which is the blockchain contracting. So you, you all may be, you're more technologists than I am. You all may be very familiar with blockchain technology. It's sort of the backbone of the whole cryptocurrency movement. But largely what the blockchain is going to do in, in our industry and others is it's a distributed ledger system where you can put out transactions out on the blockchain that would be verified through a distributed uh, sort of ledger system and they will be confirmed and value will be exchanged. So think about a, you know, a day when your meter on your house is blockchain enabled and it's actually contracting according to criteria you set with various other people in your neighborhood. That can happen. And when that happens, the backbone of that will be a pretty exciting sort of portal or platform-based economy. <clears throat> so with all that said, right, so if that's really where we're going, what are the inhibitors? Like, why, why aren't we there yet? You know, the first thing I'd say is we're definitely making progress, right? We're, we have smart meters, which are two-way enabled devices. Um, 2010, there were 5 million smart meters in the United States. Today, it's 58 million. <clears throat> that still means that we probably got 150 million dumb meters, but we're getting there. So the infrastructure is going in. Distributed sensors, such as the one I just shared with you. Companies are working on that, not just my company, but others. And so increasingly, equipment, when it gets stalled in your home or your uh, factory or your facility, will have embedded sensor technology in it. And that sensor technology will be IoT and it will be connected. Uh, the other thing is distributed energy. And I hit on this, 
you know, there's plenty of state and federal level, level subsidies that are driving the proliferation of distributed energy. And the more distributed energy is, the more problems we can solve and the more transactions we can enable. And there are some forward thinking states. You know, Jeff mentioned New York. Uh, New York State is, has a very interesting discussion going on right now. They have something called reinventing the energy vision, <clears throat> which is a discussion that's happening with the state level regulators, the governor, the local utilities, and other industry participants, uh, including technology and platform companies about what could this all look like in 10 years, right? How can we do energy differently rather than just building a central, you know, power station and trying to push those electrons through dis distribution networks and transmission networks? Um, th so there are a lot of things that are sort of what I would say tailwinds pushing us in the right direction. <clears throat> But there's, there's some headwinds as well. Uh, the, the industry itself, um, there's you know, many states and utilities that are flat out opposed to smart meters. They're not installing them, they're opposed to them. And even if they did install them, they don't wanna give anybody but themselves access to that data, right? So that is a huge inhibitor. I think we see you know, with all of the presenters today that the key to all of this is access to data and information. And if you can have data and information, then you can really start to build out a coherent sort of ecosystem. Um, and, and, you know, obviously utilities under the existing sort of rate regime are not in the business of helping you lower consumption. Because if you, that is, you know, that's how they make their money is through the rate per unit rate that they're selling you. And so for utilities to sort of get behind it, we have to change the way people are thinking about energy consumption and regulatory rate making. And, and finally, there's no price <clears throat> at a distribution level, right? I challenge you to figure out what the price of electricity is, you know, for in this particular distribution say, station in Boston, you know, on a real time basis. Very, very difficult. So for people to make optimal and wise decisions, you need some sort of price transparency mechanism that does not exist today. So with that, I think I'm out of time, and luckily, I'm out of slides, too. So uh, be happy to uh, take. <laughs> Building on your point of how you're regulated and reimbursed now, if you could go to a regulator in the UK, the US, Naruk, whatever it's called these days, what's the one thing you want the regulator to let you do that would make information, data, analytics a win-win for the efficiency of the organization and for putting your residential and non-residential customers in a position to decide, yes, we want to stick with you, no, go away, we want an alternative. Yeah, it, good question in the sense that my list, I have had a lot of discussions with regulators and my list is a lot longer than one thing. But I think one of the things that we strongly are advocating for is access to information. And that really, um, Texas and California are leading the way through their green button initiative. And what that means is that uh, you have a smart meter. That smart meter is gathering information at, at fairly rapid intervals. And that information can be available to you as a homeowner or a business owner or whoever you choose <clears throat> through a simple application they call green button. So you can download your information and share it. Once somebody understands what your consumption profile is and actually has that, inf uh, that information, the innovative things that they can do in terms of offers <clears throat> dramatically increases. So I would say, you know, what we're sort of ubiquitously uh, advocating for is more access to information and not having it all just owned and controlled by the utility. But the green, green button model is the one you, is a template that you're happy with. I think the green button model is, is definitely a step in the right direction. Yes? 
Hi. Uh, so it seems like the platform is sort of a differentiator within your industry, and I imagine some of the other utilities are trying to do similar things. Uh, could you talk to a little bit where you're seeing relative to competitors where they want to be collaborative versus competitive? Well, I guess it, it defines who's a competitor these days, right? Um, we have we we, have, we certainly have people that we compete with within the energy industry, including utilities. Um, but I think and and we're all sort of as as what Peter described as dabblers is what I would say, right? We're entrenched and we're trying to move from this this model to you know how can we become more innovative, more customer facing? How can we embrace platforms uh, and ecosystems? But there are a lot of, if you go and talk with the little sort of startup uh, entities that are thinking about energy, to me, they're really doing some, some pretty exciting stuff, including you know, small companies uh, that are doing some of that blockchain contracting and peer-to-peer -peer stuff. Um, those are really people that we watch closely. Uh, and of course, you have you know, Google, has, a, has an everything, and Google has a division that looks at energy and energy consumption and connected homes as well.